Stories like crazy, because everyone has mental health, and everyone has a story, and sometimes they're crazy. Join Lori Lane Murphy and me, Adriana Prosser, as we talk about dealing with, struggling with, and managing mental health with storytellers who want to share their true life story. Get in the conversation with us and talk to us on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe on SoundCloud and iTunes. Now, let's smash some stigma. Hey, Stigma Fighters. If you're listening to this right away, then I would love for you to know to come out to Toronto at the Social Capital down on the Danforth for our May 10th Mental Health Week Awareness Show, Stories Like Crazy Live. Yeah, that's right. We're going to have some of our favorite guests come on out and share their stories live with you. So I hope to see you there. Check out our Facebook uh, event for more details. But right now, we are hearing from a comedian and storyteller, Jay Freeborn, about anxiety and stress and how you can fill that void with food and booze sometimes, or more specifically, ice cream five times a day. Here, let's hear his story. So, like, really the story of, like, where my life is at right now starts with a a mother and, like, a wife that I don't know dying. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, And then, like, I think any story that is, like, a little bit too long and has a little bit too much detail, there's, like, a bit of a prologue. So I'm um, about, like, uh, 24 at the time, and I just started uh, working a dog walking job, which is why I like the dog so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was good, and I started dating a girl, and we'll just call her Heather, mostly because uh, that's her name. <laughs> and uh, it was good, it was fun, it was just like young couples, and just like hanging out and stuff. And then I uh, I feel like when you dislike yourself, more so when you hate yourself, you start to worry and imprint your own worries on other people. Mm. And what I was really worried about was that she was going to leave me because I didn't have enough money, mm. which just wasn't the case. And that was because she grew up very, very wealthy, and she had a great job, and I didn't have any of those things. So I was working uh, not only during the week and then doing stand-up and trying to get as many paid gigs, which takes you away, but then I would work weekends as well. So I would start working seven days a week, give or take. Yeah. And then so those like dates that were fun and going out and interesting and like afternoon delight stuff just very quickly went away mm-hmm. because I was worried about getting her gifts or getting her great things for Christmas or her for her birthday right. or for small things and then um my job started to be very stressful like dog walking can be one of those great jobs that's um, just very freeing and then you get to do whatever you want and you're just like befriend dogs all the time but I worked for a company that didn't really care about its employees I cared about the dogs enough in terms of their own safety but what they wanted to do was expand as fast as possible Mm -hmm. so they could eventually sell the company Right. So there was no interviews with dogs beyond a certain type. So there was sometimes a lot of like, and because I was one of the only men that worked at the company, there was a lot of like uh, dangerous dogs or rescue dogs Mm. or older dogs. But the real issue is, is that the person that was scheduling stuff didn't live in Toronto. So where you would be going within a certain certain time frame was dictated by someone who didn't know the city. Right. So and so it became a perpetual for years and years a feeling of I'm constantly late. Mm-hmm. And it was very, basically to break it down, on average we would have one or two adults quitting crying a week. Wow. <laughs> uh, but I'm a team player, I'm a trooper, it doesn't matter, everything's fine, it doesn't matter, let's go, 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 go. I just started to get incredibly stressed all the time. Um, and then with stand-up too, I would start getting stressed because we were talking a little bit before about like confidence and ego, and I had very little confidence, mostly because I did no work. I would just kind of show up and... I did improv for years and sketch, and I never really wrote. So my failure to success rate in stand-up was very low. Uh, I was failing a lot. I was bombing a lot. And, and, it's, and it's really hard to feel failure and then be stressed all day and be busy all the time and never really give yourself a break. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Heather moves in, and then that's when things started to get really bad and not because of her. Um, my roommate had moved out, who was sort of someone who I'd known for a long time, and she moved in. And I really started to not be able to sleep. And I think it was because the stress started to go higher and higher. Uh, and what I do uh, when I don't feel well is I just fill my body with things. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I've known that a bunch of my relatives are been like addicted to cocaine and heroin and stuff, so I've never done anything hard. But pretty much anything else from like booze... Uh, weed, cigarettes, food, uh, I would just fill my body with it all the time, but mm-hmm. mostly uh, entertainment, anything to take me out of feeling or being alone, mm-hmm. 
with myself. So like a conversation like this is something that I would have avoided, uh, especially because it's centered around me for a long, long time, because that means you have to look at the part of yourself that you really, really dislike. Mm -hmm. So it would just be, it got to the point where I think I was eating ice cream specifically, maybe six to seven times a day. Whoa. Uh, it says the lactose intolerance. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> it was great um, for like the first month because, you know, your body, month? yeah, <laughs> yeah, has time to just like kind of adjust to it. But then I really started to balloon mm. and I got up to like 230 something pounds wow. with very little muscle, smoking two packs a day, wow. eating, you know, five, six meals a day, plus drinking. And, uh, Just hedonistic. Yeah. <laughs> anything to kind of yeah. spike in endorphins mm. without exercise. Yeah. Just just like a base feeling of everything is going to be okay. Because mm. you know that feeling when you're incredibly full? Yeah. There's something that feels like home and like safe about it. And I was mm. very much into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then on top of that, like cigarettes and then smoking a lot of weed as well. Uh, really just put me in a place of momentary satisfaction Mm -hmm. and I was I would I would say that I would be addicted to that feeling but I think that we all are because it's Mm -hmm. just searching for a sense of home because if you have an outer layer of a house like the shingles look nice and then the inside is just you know crippled or whatever I have nice shingles and then I started not sleeping mostly because like if you mix nicotine and you're eating all the time and you never exercise really you just don't sleep and this translated to me into just being um just very mean mm. to uh, like I mean you're mean internally and that's of course eventually going to leak out and mean that you're cruel to people outside so uh, I was never uh, I wouldn't say abusive uh, to my girlfriend especially I was uh, I was an okay boyfriend but I would just do the worst thing really which is to just ignore her yeah I wasn't around both in time and when I was there I was just wanted to feel a level of safety mm-hmm. and um I feel obviously really bad about it because she uh, didn't deserve that. But it, it also meant that in my uh, professional relationships, I would be rude. And the weird thing about stand-up is that the grouchy, uh, especially because I used to have like a mustache. I have like a, a mustache. I think you'd see my headshot like a mustache and a beard. I kind of look like the dickish stand-up. I wear a leather jacket. And so people just thought that that was just my MO to be rude. Like I would just... If you're hurting other people or bringing other people down, there is a quick sense of, again, satisfaction. Yes. And, again, I would just follow that route down. And there still probably are a lot of people that do dislike me and for great reasons. Like stepping on ants. Yeah, right? it feels That's like really? that. Mm-hmm. Especially because like, most comedians are so incredibly vulnerable that you it can feel like stepping on ants. Because they all have these borders that are so high that if you insult them or belittle them they can be crushed and then there brings a new sense of value to yourself which is something that's uh, Mm -hmm. really sad Mm -hmm. it's really sad and it makes me uh, feel really bad and I've built some of those relationships back and some of them will never come back Um, and then uh, there was a point where uh, we adopted two dogs we adopted uh, two rescue chihuahuas from California and that was just like a glimmer of just like happiness at home for a while and it mm-hmm. brings a sense of home when you bring something into your home yes. as you know with the two rescue dogs. Mm-hmm. Is he a rescue as well? Yeah. Yeah, there's just like this sense of, it's almost like a project, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's something outside of you that you can focus on. Exactly. And together. Exactly. Right? Yes. And it brought us together for a while and then there was a weird sense for me of jealousy to these dogs because they bonded to her because she was home more. Right. And then there was this half total love towards them and then this innate sense of hatred because I wasn't number one anymore, which mm. is uh, destructive and selfish and embarrassing mm-hmm. that I was jealous and half full of hate for these things that I loved and I still do love. It's uh, what I, one of the reasons I don't think that I could necessarily have children, which I actually think in the long run is a good lesson because I don't know if I'm able to share spotlights. <laughs> um, Typical comedian. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I was just so busy all the time. I was still working all the time. And then I tried to do more and more shows because I was lazy in one way. Because if you don't write, mm. my idea was if I get on stage more, I can write on stage more. So I went from doing five, six shows a week to 12 to 15 shows a week plus work. <laughs> 
and you must really weren't sleeping. I wasn't sleeping. It basically, and it was really time. Everything always felt like I was explaining before about the dog running job. It felt like I was late all the time because mm-hmm. it was just too much. I actually was sick one day, and someone filled in for me, and they had a car because I was a walking dog walker to transit, and they couldn't complete my route. Yeah. Um, so it basically came to where I was coming home, and I got to choose between taking a nap, showering, or eating, and I almost always chose eating, which meant that I was rarely showering, mm-hmm. just in life. Uh, which is super great for relationships. It's just, it's very helpful when you smell. And also, I'm very fair-skinned, and I burn, so I was sunburned for two years straight. Um, you obviously didn't take time for sunscreen. <laughs> I would wear sunscreen is the really? thing. Yeah, I was putting it on maybe up to ten times a day, plus oh, wow. no showering, so I was always glistening red. <laughs> And that sunscreen smell after a while is, it makes me feel sick now. Uh, it's really gross. And so it's always sticky and sad and mean. I was, picture. I know, and I would wear the same clothes all the time. And I basically stopped shaving and I would rarely get haircuts because I was concerned about money, but I was probably spending at least $200 a week just on ice cream, (laughs) Uh, which is strange. But, you know, when something makes you feel good, there is this thing, especially in modern society, where, you know, if it's not drugs and it's not prescription medicine, but it's just something that makes me feel good, then it's my type of medicine. You'll spend whatever you have to just to do on that. Um... So we've been dating for a while now. Uh, we've been living together, and it's it's okay-ish. We both have this, like, false sense of safety from each other and from the house. And, you know, she changed it, so she felt like it was a home and um, got a promotion and was living life. And then one day she comes to me, and she's like, what do you think of this? And she shows me her phone, and I read it, and then she tells me the backstory. She goes, basically, my male best friend's from high school, who's part of, like, my small friend group in high school, my only friends in high school. Uh, his mother died two weeks ago. And I'm like, okay, like, that's horrible. And she goes, yeah, I didn't know what to say because I haven't seen him in a long time. And so I reached out, and I sent my message, and the message basically read, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's just call him Rob, mostly because that's his name. And... <laughs> Uh, I'm so sorry for your loss, Rob. I have, really have no words. If you need anything, like just let me know or whatever. And he hits her back with, uh, thank you. And I've been in love with you since I was 15. What? Which is just, I respect. Which wow, is just, just go for it. Just why? Get just in, balls to the wall. Yeah, just get like, in there. Not? That is just... Sidebar, grief is weird. Yes, right? He's like, I'm right? doing this. Life and death. Life and death. It really right? makes you recognize I need to tell that there's you very this little truth. time. Okay. Exactly. Shit. Also, great game. Just oh, good seriously. game. <laughs> very good game. <laughs> well done, Rob. Well, 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 well done. done. Kudos. Ten points to Griffin. Exactly. <laughs> And but we it, it led to a strange conversation where she was like, "What should I do?" And I was mm. like, "Well, there's clearly three options. One, <laughs> uh, you message him back and tell him that uh, you clearly have a boyfriend that you like, love, and are with. And uh, also now, be like that you love and with, and is fat and red all the time, and greasy. Yeah, and very very <laughs> greasy, and tired, and tired, and and horrible. And um, uh, or you know, you can say that you want to meet up, but that uh, you're not there, or you can leave me and, and, and go with Rob, if that's what you feel like. That's just what I'd rather know now. I'd like to know now. Mm-hmm. And she, I remember her not answering verbally, but more with a grunt, as she just kind of stirs. I can't remember what she was making. Um, and then the relationship started to be very strained. And, and, and mm-hmm. one of the things I think in a relationship that is very telling is the amount of sex you have, especially if you're not married, especially if you're under 30, and it started to be once or twice a month. I mean, I don't blame her. I was definitely gross. I was <laughs> unattractive. I didn't smell nice. I wasn't kind. Why would you have sex with me? But then when there was a large drop and it goes to zero, when I started fantasizing about asking her what was going on in streetcars and being afraid, I knew that there was a problem. Mm. And then family day of last year... I remember walking into our bedroom and there were, she was sitting on the bed with the dogs and I think she was watching something on her computer. And I said to her, I said, I, I think I need to know like what's going on. Is something going on? And we had a, a brief discussion about 
um, just the relationship and about how clearly I'm not around enough and, you know, we should reconnect. Um, and then as I'm leaving, uh, she goes, uh, well, you know, I, I love you. And the automatic response, I feel like, when you're in a long-term relationship is just, I love you too, and then you go and do your own thing. But I, for some reason, had this deep, guttural feeling, and I followed her, and I said, do you? Ooh. Wow. And she said, of course I do. And I said, do you really? And she says, of course I do. I said, why? And she gave me a bunch of reasons why. And I said, are you sure? Like, is that real? And she went, yes, of course. And I said, do you really love me? Like, okay. is this a real thing? Is that what you actually feel? And she goes, yeah, I love you. And I go, do you really? Like, why? Like, how? Like, why? And she goes, well, I really love you. And then I go, do you really? <laughs> and she pauses and then goes, oh, my God, I think I realized right now that I don't. And I went, let's hold on, let's hold on. Let's <laughs> just, everybody just relax. Everybody just hold on. Let's just, let's just back up. Let's just, and she gets up and she starts uh, putting things in boxes. Wow. And basically just goes, you know, I, I don't think that I do. Uh, and we always had uh, a plan Basically, she then went on to be like, it's over. Like, it's over right now. It's over. Because, like, what's the point? We always knew that this would kind of end. Were you shocked? Yeah, I was very Mm -hmm. shocked. Especially because, like, she was my base level of security. Like, it was home. She was home. The dogs were home. Well, wait until you're done, but I'm going to ask you something about poking with a stick. It's like, (laughs) I'll ask you right now. You were poking something with a stick, not realizing she'd actually bite. She'd actually take it. I knew that she would, but I didn't want her to. Um, and our relationship was strange and most people really disliked the way that we approached it but we always knew that we wouldn't kind of last forever I don't really like the ideals of lasting forever I think that you know from 15 to 25 and 25 to 35 and 35 to 45 is normally four or five different people like aside from the science that every seven years your cells replicate and you're a totally different person you're just so different and also there were some differences in that I was probably in, and am probably still going to be poor for a very long time <laughs> uh, and then she was starting to make great money and to even equal out our money she was putting like 75% of it away so that we would kind of live in the same place mm-hmm. so she was making concessions when I never was but we always had a plan for when we break up we'd had you know when you buy stuff who gets it who gets the dogs uh, a plan for uh, moving out oh my god um, which honestly, everyone was like, "That's horrible." But then when we did break That's up, it was mature. great. Yeah. It was so helpful. I know exactly what dog I get. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't get either. Oh. Yeah, but uh, they were hers. Um, and uh, so the plan was uh, when we break up that uh, the other person can live there for a month. And that was a very uh, difficult time because I found out that she had been seeing Rob. Oh. Uh, she asserts that it was in a non structural way. It's like, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. But um, I can't blame her yet again. It's just one of those things that good for you. I'm glad you did. If, if one of my female friends came to me and said... My boyfriend shitty all the time, never around. He got super fat. He's gross. And I think I found someone that I've been in love with for 17 years. I'd be like, I think you have your answer. Mm. Mm-hmm. If that's what you should do. And um, I will say that in the beginning there was a, lo- a silver lining for me that was very selfish in that he looks like me, but he sort of uh, was even larger than me and stumpier. Wow. So it was a, sort of a worse version than, than me, which is something I held on to for a long time. <laughs> and now you look great. Very helpful. See, yeah. Ha-ha. Yeah, but so does he, right? Oh. Yeah, so does he. <laughs> and I think he's still a professional skateboarder. Um, I don't think I've ever met him. He's, he seems like a very nice man. Um, and she's very nice as well and very smart and beautiful and stuff. Uh, but this is when really it, things got worse. I... Stopped doing a lot of stand-up. I started drinking a lot. Mm -hmm. Somehow I started smoking more. Um, I was not able to sleep really at all. Um, One of the good things was that I stopped being mean. Uh, It's really hard to be mean when you're trying not to cry all the time. Mm -hmm. Because being mean requires a little vulnerability that you don't really uh, know 
notice. Um, and I really started having something that I still have, which is if I'm alone at night for too long, I start having night anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. and I also, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's really bad. Mm-hmm. And um, I also did a little bit of research and I started to realize that my job was giving me um, small aspects of post-traumatic stress. So I quit. And uh, that was very helpful. And I actually got another job by complaining about how I hated being a dog walker and how I quit that day. And then I came off stage and the club owner was like, do you want to work here? And yeah, I still work at the com- same comedy club. Um, but I, the thing I started doing after, which is another quick fix, is I started dating a lot, a lot. Um, I've always kind of been good at first dates because, I don't know, I'm nice and I'm not creepy. <laughs> That's a real selling feature, ladies. That's not what I thought you were going to say at all. That was no, but I, I think that that's like the base. That is a base. Right? That is definitely a base. But also you're a storyteller, and first dates are very much let's exchange stories. And my favorite that's thing to good, do on yes. first dates is specifically to ask them about the other bad dates. Mm. That's See, that's, that's game, too. Yeah, I agree. You know. Listen, I'm here to tell you again at my advanced years and several husbands later and being a, like I was a whore before ho was a word mm. do you know what I mean that's yeah. I you know this what I'm saying conversation's taking a turn so I have all this <laughs> wealth of experience and I think the one thing that like I would totally date you because you're charming mm. shock able like you said to tell stories to exchange so we wouldn't mm. know all of the other loserish things about you at first yeah, I think that's what first dates is, is to slowly let leak out what your issues are over yeah, dates. Yeah. Hide your baggage and see if they match. Yeah. yeah. That's not how I work now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually all about qualifying, which is basically just telling everybody exactly what you like. And if mm-hmm. they don't like it, you exactly, you just like, next, mm-hmm. I have time. I'm going to die sooner than later. Um, but it was a lot of dating. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had more free time. And I basically would uh, be waiting at open mics because sometimes it takes, like I do a lot of book shows and paid work, but I still like to do open mics. So a lot of the things that normally you do at open mics is you chat to other comics. And what I started started doing was just uh, using Tinder, OkCupid, and whatever as I was waiting. So I would probably be online dating for at least four to five hours a day, Mm -hmm. which translates into great numbers of dates. Mm -hmm. Um, It was weird because she lived there for a month. But she really wasn't there Mm -hmm. for the whole month. It was great because we had a lot of conversations just about the relationship and about herself. And I think that's one of the reasons that I have a positive view of all of it is because she stuck around purely for the conversations. I mean, this is when the wealth of her family really kicked in because she was able to stay in a hotel for that entire month, but just Mm -hmm. keep her stuff at uh, the house, which is just, that's all great. That's very, very nice. Um, We did have a final conversation the day that she moved in with Rob a month later. Um. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That just gives me a stomachache. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I remember when I told my friends that they started to really dislike her. Well, But I don't. That's I, good, I and this is about you. Yeah, and <laughs> it's also about her and that, you know. No, if, no, it's about you. I mean, it's about me, but, like, she was such a part of me, and, and it's such a nice story and, and fact that she was able to find a person. Do you know what I mean? Like, just to find her person. I don't know if they're going to get married or what. even if marriage is an implication of love or, or long-term happiness, but she found her person. Like, I remember one time we we really shouldn't have been together we really shouldn't have even been friends like i remember once she we had a disagreement about how i wasn't spending enough time she said you know what why don't i buy us ticket to a marley's game which is the uh like the leafs farm team yeah farm team and i don't like sports at all and i was just very frank as i used to always be and never consider other people's feelings and i said i would rather die than do that that wow. sounds like garbage wow i don't like sports and i also uh don't like drinking. I like drinking to just feel something, but she liked drinking a lot. We really shouldn't have been friends or even really been hanging out. And he loves hockey and he loves all the same stuff. And um, so, where are you now? Like with all, of, like when all of that happened, and mm-hmm. now you're trying to figure. Now you're still fat and greasy and red. Mm-hmm. So, what was the transition? What was the? What did you transform 
transition, transform? What have you learned? I basically, I still have another six months to do if you'd like me to do the six months. The podcast isn't that long. So you're on your non-creepy uh, Tinder horse, yep. and you're, yeah. you're doing and then, the rounds. So basically what happens is I start noticing that a lot of my stand-up friends that were as quote-unquote loserish as I was start losing a lot of weight very quickly, and in a very healthy way. And so I start picking their brains, and I start... Um, the main like positive stuff that I, I live now, which is just, like, I'm depressed. I... Don't, I don't want to die, but I don't want to live. It's mm-hmm. like this weird yep. middle ground. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I start doing a lot and of research. And that's a thing, just yes, so you know. Yes, very it's much a thing. so. Yeah. It's yeah. passive suicidal. Thinking. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I start basically going and peeking around and learning. Well, that's one of the things that I'm lucky that my parents are always pushing is that to just keep learning outside of school and stuff. So mm-hmm. I quickly learned how to find positivity in one of them, the, the base one that. I still go back to if things get really bad is just um, positive affirmation exercises, just my, which I turned into basically just staring into the mirror and saying that I deserve things, I deserve love, I love you, you're great, until I start to tingle. That's when I would stop. And the first time took about like 45 minutes. And then now it happens like whenever. I don't really need to do it anymore, so I don't do them anymore, but I should probably do them once or twice a week. Um, I started working out, and one of the great websites that I started using was this thing called uh, www.darebee.com so it's like just the word dare and the word be and dot com and it basically is just like hundreds of workout programs and it's for free mm. and uh, so you can type in like what you have whether or not it's exercise equipment or you just want to do calisthenics or you have a, mm-hmm. a bar to do pull ups um, and I so I start this transition and I uh, I was still smoking and then Easter weekend I lied to my parents and told them I had a gig uh, when I didn't, just because I didn't want to speak to them, because mm-hmm. I still hadn't seen them. Mm-hmm. And I go to this open mic at the club that I work at, and I uh, always made it a policy to never flirt or be attracted to other comedians, because it's just not helpful. It's just not. <laughs> it always ends in blowing up. And I also, the, one of the things I hate is anybody who makes noise or heckling during a show, like when it's when you're not laughing or just clapping, I hate it. And so we went on stage and it was a, a very beautiful woman yeah, who was very funny and very new to stand-up. And I just found myself um, uh, feeling the same thing I feel now, which is like this bright, like warmth, red, just that just in my chest. And I just started shifting my weight and just kind of uh, swearing, just being like, oh, shit oh shit and my friends were like you're being really loud so I went outside and I started smoking cigarettes and it was the first time in years that I was like I'm on soon and I just had this wish and want to do well and I really put I started just writing I started really just writing and I went on stage and did incredibly well and I didn't speak to her and that's just because that's inappropriate you're not supposed to you know even if I did think that she was attractive don't talk to her because it could lead down a road that was weird and then um uh, the next week I was at a different show. My friend walked in with her. And uh, he was like, oh, hey, do you guys know each other? And I was, of course, like, no, I don't. Hey, how are you? <laughs> and she was like, I saw you at that show. You were so funny. I was like, oh, I don't even remember. It was crazy. <laughs> uh, and then uh, they went across the street to Comedy Bar, which is a great venue. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll see you guys later because I didn't want to follow that thread. And then I was like, fuck that. And I re- physically ran. Um, and then, but, but it had been a long time for me to choose, so by the time I got there, the thing with new female comedians is that most comedians don't have the same kind of rules that I do, so they'll swarm them. They'll just, because, you know, most, you know, you're new to the industry, and you're probably willing to have sex with some comedian, and so I think there was maybe five or six comedians speaking to her at one time. Literally, like, in a semicircle. Good She's very beautiful, very smart, it very adult. It happens to me adult. all the time, I would, uh, Yeah, <laughs> That's I would think problem. so. It is, for both of you. <laughs> And uh, I was like, I don't really want to, this just just makes me feel really, really bad. And normally that type of stuff wouldn't bother me. So I just, I left and I went home and I just went on Facebook because I normally would just to kind of, and I see that she sent me a friend request and I of course answered it and was like, oh, that was fast. And she's like, I sent it to you the second you got off stage last week. Do you want to upgrade to my phone number? Mm. And I'm just like, I still feel it now. I feel like I'm kind of, uh, it's like a roller coaster feeling. Mm Mm-hmm. And I uh, 
then quickly found out that she was like, I'm leaving in a, I'm moving to Montreal you know, on Friday. And it was Tuesday. And she was like, well, let's meet up in the week. And I was busy when she was free and she was busy when I was free. And then she was like, I have a birthday on a Friday. Why don't you come? And I was like, for sure. And that's something I would never do because I run my show every Friday. So I got a guest host and I went to the birthday and I got a little bit of information. She was seeing some guy, but they weren't dating seriously. They were just kind of, you know, she's leaving Montreal. This is my boyfriend. Um, and I met him and uh, he seemed nice enough. But then I guess he found out it was a comic and he wanted to try to do comedy. He tried to impress me by telling me a story about how a certain specific sexual activity that he liked to do with her in graphic detail. And I was like, this is great. And even both me and my friend who are both, you know, we're, we're guys that are sexual, I guess. And we were both like, this is fucked up. <laughs> uh, I later found out the story's not even true. And so it's even stranger. Yeah. And so he was just trying to like reach us on like a man level, which Creepy. I'm a, I don't like sports and I don't have that level really. Um, uh, and then I asked her if she wanted to come outside and we're smoking and uh, we end up kissing a little bit because uh, I don't care about this creepy dude who <laughs> expressed his love of coconut oil no, um, no yeah no, he's a creep no. uh, and then she's like I feel weird he's here and I'm clearly attracted to you and I really like you um, you know I'm leaving and whatever and I feel really really sad <laughs> And I tell my friend, he's like, I'm coming, let's do drugs. And I, of course, go, all right, sounds like this is the first time I'm doing cocaine. This is going to be weird, but I'm not even leaving the party. Let's let's just crash and burn. I'm still very destructive. And then he shows up, uh, and she's like, put out your hand. And this is the first time I end up doing acid, ah. which was incredibly beneficial for me because I just uh, bonded with all of her friends. Mm-hmm. Um, they all really liked me. I kept telling her how great I was. And then we end up speaking outside of the bar for like a few hours. And then she leaves and goes home. And uh, then she goes to Montreal. And I remember texting her, like, have a nice flight or whatever. And putting down the phone and saying, I'm going to talk to her all day, every day. And then when she maybe moves back in September, I can tell her that I'm in love with her in October. Because that'll have been long enough. And that's when I started to really transform both mentally and physically because I was like, if you're really in love with somebody, you can't really love them properly if you don't love yourself. Mm -hmm. So I was working out twice a day. I was eating like broccoli for breakfast. I was um, practicing mindfulness. I was reading books. I was um, writing jokes for the first time, like really writing down things. And I really started to transform my life and we texted all day, every day, for months and months and months. Um, I eventually go and visit her in Montreal. And it was just like this beautiful, interesting, magical weekend that whenever we would reference how nice it was, she would have this moment of sadness because she still wasn't sure if she was going to get back with that guy or not. And so I was living in this strange world of denial and that, you know, whatever, she's going to pick me. It's clear, it's clear she's going to pick me. And I will say that the other man is much more handsome than I am. Uh, he sort of looks like a, an H and M model. That's the best mm. way to put it. But like a scruffy one. So he's a, he's a Aren't they all? he's a pretty nice. <laughs> no, some of them are very clean cut. This is like a scruffy bearded. Like I'm a wayward. I have bracelets type of man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I I think that when you are improving just for yourself, it can be hard. But when you're when you have like a purpose especially if it's a positive one, which is I just need to love myself so I can love her and everybody else. And it's really started to transform my mentality. It started being nicer to people and it started to form friendships. And um, I really wanted my life to be full. And so I was looking for a sense of, it was misguided in some ways, but incredibly beneficial in the other because I was searching for a sense of wealth, but not monetary. I, I wanted my life to be interesting and fun and positive so that when and if I convinced her to love me back, she would feel like I was really worth it. So the byproduct was that I started to live that and started to do more interesting things and started to see more adventure and, and, and really just live positively and walking out twice a day and eating well. And and then somebody moved in with me who is probably one of my favorite comedians. His name's Cameron Phoenix. And Cameron looks and feels, this doesn't exist, but he looks and feels like a yoga professor. 
Okay. So he's uh, bald with a long beard and glasses, and he's very flexible, and he's such a good writer. He's one of the best writers I've ever met. And what's great about Cameron is that he's meditated every day for the past, like, three or four years. But he's never pushy about it. A lot of people that are that into meditation and yoga will be very like, oh, it'll fix your whole life. And he'll just very calmly bring it up. And he, he has a thing where he only will bring it up three or four times. Uh, and then after that, he'll never bring it up again. Hmm. Uh, and one thing that I still think about all the time is that when he brought it up to me the third time, he told me that it was clear that I was having a lot of mental anguish. And he told me this story about, this really old story about these two monks that are walking along a road and they see a dog sitting on a nail. And one monk says to the other, why doesn't the dog just get up? And the other monk says, because it doesn't hurt enough. Hmm. And I think that that is one of the things that really pushed me to eventually meditate all the time. Hmm. So I start bonding with him and I start talking to him about this girl. And uh, she's supposed to come visit me on the way to a wedding and she cancels and because that that guy that uh, uh, she'd been seeing found out that I had gone to visit to Montreal and he kind of got strange about it obviously I don't blame him and she basically calls me and says I'm not going to talk to either of you for a month hmm. uh, she started working on this really uh, high pressure job which uh, is for like a I can probably tell you guys afterwards but I don't want to say what company it is right now just because it's online obviously she might want to go back um so I was absolutely crushed, but there was this weird moment in when she's on the phone, she's like, I just don't want to talk to you, and you know, you know that that's the end of this interesting roller coaster, and there was a moment that was like, I should just tell her she's a stupid bitch. Uh, how can you throw away something that's clearly so good? How can you meet someone and instantly know that there's a level of attraction and best friendness? We would just have so much fun all of the time. I never met anybody, and she'd, she'd express the same feelings. But then I was like, do you, if you, re do you really love this person? Is that something, that you, is it beyond romantic sexual feelings? And it was, so I just told her to just not feel shame and not feel bad and just do what she needed to do and try and find some hole that was there and why you needed to not speak to either of us and fill it with whatever is positive and to <laughs> just not worry. Get him, Bueller. <laughs> And she found that really great, and whatever, I hung up the phone and just moved on with my life. Um, and one of the things that she'd asked me to do was to do more comedy, because she knew it would make me happy. <laughs> the dog's licking up here, which is so cute. I'm sorry, I can't make it. No, it's nice. And uh, so one of the things that really led to where I am now is I was invited to do the Windsor Comedy Festival, which Ooh. is our competition. Uh, well, I was invited to do the competition part, and I looked at it, and uh, one of my favorite comedians who's hilarious and one of the better writers and performers in the city, his name is Che Dorena, and he's also the hardest working comic probably in the country. I see his name all the time. Yeah, Che is all absolutely amazing. And he was also competing, and I was like, well, I've lost. And so I started to have this mentality of I just want to be Rocky. I just want to go take him to the limit. I really want to make him work for it. And I started prepping. I started writing for the first time. I started really analyzing jokes. I started editing jokes. I started calling in favors. And I was doing, you know, a bunch of spots a week. And uh, I really got ready. It was the first time I ever had tight material. And comics really prize having a tight set. It was the first time I've ever really done it. And I uh, went to the competition. And it was very friendly. And we had a lot of fun. It was really like a boys weekend uh, in certain ways, which I don't really do. And... Um, he ended up beating me by only one vote, wow. which I really, really liked. Um, and uh, I started leading this life that was very interesting because I knew that she was following my Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. So I started leading this life that was even better than it was before, just full of adventure and fun and interesting trips and cool people and cool experiences and cool bars. I also really stopped drinking. Uh, so, but I would still go to places if I wanted to. I now basically was maybe 10 pounds heavier than I was now. So I went from like 230, 240 to like 180. Um, working out twice a day. Uh, still. Uh, but, you know, she's not going to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, Che really kind of helped me uh, with stand-up. And he's also my close friend. And I asked him about it. And he had some great advice. <laughs> And then we come back, and, and uh, I keep living this life, which is great. It was positive for me. And um, and then one day, I walk into the, one of the worst open mics. This is, like, late September now. 
Um, I'd been incredibly depressed, but still doing positive things because she was gone. And one of the things when I do when I'm really depressed is I start watching movies from the civil rights era, like Malcolm X, and <laughs> because how can I be sad if they had so much struggle? It's a stupid idea, but it's very distracting. And then I walk into one of the worst open mics in the city, and Che's there, and he goes, what are you doing tonight? It was a Friday, and he goes, i got to host my show. I'm going to do this before I am, same as you. And he goes, do you want to open up for me for Just for Laughs Toronto tonight? Ooh. And I was like, yes, I do. And I did, and it was great. And the only thing I could think about the whole time was just I should tell her because she had come back to the city and we weren't really talking. And I did tell her, and she was like, that's great. Um, let's, uh, do you want to meet for, like, I'm going to be at Comedy Bar. Do you want to come by? And I said, yeah, and I meet her there. And again, there's, you know, just a bunch of comedians. But this time it's not just other comics. It's, like, my comedy heroes that are hitting on her. Mm-hmm. And Cameron comes over to me and my roommate, and he goes, I can't sit here and do this. And I go, do what? We're having a great time. He's like, I can't sit here and watch you watch her. Mm. We should go. So we go home. And I'd been talking to him about how I'd been pining for her and just really sad about it the whole time. And he was like, well, like, what are you doing? And I go, you know, it's hard because I see her all the time on, like, Facebook and Instagram. And he goes, well, because Cameron's not a technology guy. Like, he is. He likes computer games and stuff, but he doesn't like social media. So he goes, what do you mean? Because he doesn't have Instagram. He doesn't really use Facebook. He goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, I can see all the stuff he's doing. He goes, you, 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 you plugged into the Matrix, man. <laughs> and he's like, unplug. And I was like, that would mean that I would block her number. That would mean I would block her on Instagram. That would mean I would block her on Facebook. A lot of people would find this very offensive and hurtful. And he goes, well, you got to do whatever you can to feel normal. So I do. Yeah. And I go to sleep uh, feeling horrible. Mm-hmm. And I wake up to a number that I don't recognize. And that's probably the only reason I answered it was because I was waking up. I don't ever answer numbers that I don't recognize because there's so many. It's like, you want a cruise. <laughs> uh, but it was her. And she said, I rode my bike half an hour to my friend's house so I could use her phone. I don't uh, really want to ever be away from you. I think I would like to start dating you right now. Can you please let me come to your house? I'd like to have a discussion about this. I was like, okay. And I remember walking into the living room because for the first hour I wake up, I'm like not a human being. And I go to Cameron and he's making tea. And I go, she just called me and she said she wants to date me. And he went, what? And I went, she says she loves me. So I don't know what I'm doing. Is this real? Am I awake? And he went, yeah. And I went, okay. And she comes over and uh, we start dating. And I think that's when the real work started. Because we were both on this path of positivity and we're still dating. I just left her house right now and she just went to therapy as I came here. And it's when I was Aww. like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I don't, again, I don't really like the whole things of like, oh, happiness forever or marriage. But I think that she's definitely my best friend and I have the most fun with her and she's the most supportive and she's constantly um, telling me to just improve myself. And uh, I think it culminates with this that post that I posted. And do you mind if I read it? Yeah, go ahead. Is a finish. Um, <laughs> You're such a performer. Give me a big finish here. Because yeah. we got to bookend this. Yeah, I posted it. So the reason that I posted this post was because I was terrified to talk about this stuff out loud. I've been mulling it over for a while. And that's why I knew that I had to do it. Because one of the things that I used to live by and I stopped... Uh, when I started dog walking, I guess, was that uh, nothing is really worth it unless you're at least a little bit afraid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, the post is just a picture of me uh, where I'm really heavy holding a dog and then me my way now holding a dog. So it reads, um, it's been a year since my ex-girlfriend broke up with me, packed her things, took the dogs and left. I couldn't blame her then and I still won't. I was 50 pounds overweight, worked a dog walking job I hated, was sleeping maybe two to three hours a night, and sluggishly bumbling through stand-up comedy. This, of course, translated to a perpetual cycle of failure and self-hate. I was very sad, angry, and lost. I never worked hard at anything except for bearing these feelings of booze, weed, and mostly food. I was a stupid, fat, grumpy, rude loser. When she left, I had to really look at my life, and I had to realize that she didn't even leave because I was born grumpy and fat, but because she reconnected with a guy she'd been in love with since she was 15. It's a pretty good reason to go. Well, what did I want now? I wanted to find some peace. I wanted to be good at comedy. I wanted to even like, well, even love my life. I worked out, ate better, lost weight, dated lots of women, did soul searching, played with the idea of quitting stand-up. Maybe I should go back to school. Quit smoking. I stopped drinking. I dropped 75% of my sugar intake and smoked way less weed. I was still bored and restless. 
bracket. It just clicked into my head that if I really had to explain what happened to get me here, uh, it would be a horribly slow Lifetime movie-esque status, which is what this podcast has kind of been. Um, <laughs> and I'm halfway there already, so I'll just cut to it. I met two people that made me realize if you work hard, look deep inside yourself, and are really uh, look at the things that produce anything worthwhile, you realize that it's hard work at loving others, working hard at comedy, working hard at learning, working hard at loving yourself. And those two people are specifically Cameron and the girl that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. They did it in a non-preachy way, and they changed my life. Here are the basics of what I picked up. Meditation, working hard every day, looking at where your time goes, mindfulness, being kind to others, actually listening, establishing goals, think about what you eat, don't believe the stories you tell yourself, they're almost never true. That one's incredibly important, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, stretch. Read the things that are really worth it will scare you. The people around you dictate so much of your internal dialogue. Develop positive routines. So why did I type this? Well, I think in some ways it's because an emotional display like this filled with the contents of self-help pamphlet terrifies me. And the old me would and still is belittling it. But fuck that. In another way, it's a quiet thank you to the two people that helped me the most. It's also an apology because for the two years or several years, I was a self-hating asshole with living on little to no sleep that resulted in me being rude, cruel, and cutting to so many people. But mostly, it's a message to say that if you want a better life, you can have it. So if you message me, I'll send you links and materials. Nothing is magic, though. It's hard work. The last time I worked this hard was in grade 8 for the mock trial of Lou Riel. It's been uh, 14 years of coasting. I'm pretty scared it's going to go back, and I'm going to go eat Eggs Benedict now. Yeah, so that's the thing that got you guys to ask me to come on here. Perfect. Oh, yes. sweet. Thank you. No, thank you guys. <laughs> oh, see, you can do this. You can do this. We were just, you know, we're always looking at um, ways to just sort of find your way back to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and it takes some people a lifetime. Some people never do, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're living with a mental illness. or and, and also, just as a sidebar to this, and I think our listeners already know this, is that um, everyone has mental health. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to have a diagnosable mental illness, but that doesn't mean other people don't get depression situationally or you know get overly anxious. Adri is also diagno <laughs> diagnosed. As I sit here picking my fingers. Exactly, nose. but it's it's important to know that you know even whether you're diagnosed or not. Um, the ability to kind of look inward is always going to make you better outward. Absolutely. You know, and I've always been a, you know, I, I don't watch a heck of a lot of um, Ellen DeGeneres, but the one thing I will say is when she, her motto is just be kind to each other. Exactly. And that starts with being kind to you. Yes. Mental illness lies to you all the time, and it tells you you're not worth anything all the time. So does media and most people. Mm -hmm. Most people do. Most mm -hmm. people do. And I think, you know, coming back to... Um, we three sitting here we're allowed to feel okay about ourselves not only that we're allowed to feel like we're, we're good at stuff and we're valuable and we you know the, the constant there's enough shit out there anyway that if we don't become our own best advocate we can't do for other people and it sounds like such a cliche but it's so true I can't be in my instance I can't be a good wife or partner I can't be a good mother I have a 16-year-old son, and I constantly, every night I go to bed and think about the ways I've scarred him. Every night. Really? How am I scarring him? Or how, how, and he's the happiest little bugger. He has terrible OCD, generalized anxiety, ADHD. But if you ask him to describe himself, and this is, take a page out of this book, um, describe yourself to me, and he always says happy. That's good. And I think, how have I scarred how have I scarred him? So I'm listening to you and, and, you know, everything that you've kind of, it's not even about what you've been through. It's about what we all go through. Mm -hmm. Like we all go through stuff. We all have our own story. We all have our own, um, challenges that we either lay down and die or we decide to keep going. I mean, those are the two choices every morning we have. I think that there's a third one that's the scarier one, which is that you just keep walking and feel like you've laid down and died. Yes, that is true. I think most that people live that life. Well, most people exist. Exactly. You know, and or I think most of us at one time or another have probably existed and thought, I remember thinking, and I remember thinking of one of my marriages, that hmm. I remember standing at the altar and thinking, and looking at him and thinking, it's just, this is good. Yeah. That's not good. This is, yeah, no, this is good. But, but this is what in love is. Mm. This is good. And then, of course, it's not. 
And it's, it's, it's the lies we tell ourselves. It's what we settle for. I think there's a lot of that. Most. And I won't settle for things anymore because I've don't. realized, you know, coming up to this big birthday, um, and by the way, don't say to me, either one of you, you're as young as you feel, or I'll cut you both. <laughs> because, because I still have less life ahead of me than I had behind me. Unless I live to 100. Mm-hmm. I might. You never know. You never know. Be the most fun gal in the, in, the, uh, in the nursing home. But I think I don't have anything to lose. We all don't have anything to lose except ourselves. Exactly. So, and like you are saying about, I don't know if there's such a thing as forever when you're in a relationship. And I think there's just always now. Exactly. And that doesn't belittle. Like, I, I hope Paul and I are together until we're dead. But we, st- we ha- today is what you have to focus on, right? There's that old Taoist saying that uh, depression comes from uh, thinking about the past, anxiety comes mm-hmm. thinking about the future, and then there's only in the present, and that's exactly. where peace is, right? And that's where mindfulness is. Exactly. It's always bringing yourself back, bringing yourself back. Because as Adrian knows, I have three weeks experience now, four weeks. I'm going, I'm going to be a therapist by January next year. Oh, that's great. And, but I just finished my first course, of which I got an A, and I've been telling everybody who listen, <laughs> listen, I have experience. In my four weeks, this is what I've learned. But it's, yeah, there, there only ever is now. Do what you need to do. Be good to yourself. Be good to the people around you, and they'll be good back, hopefully. And if they're not, cut the dead wood. 100%. Cut the dead wood. That's the hardest thing. It's so hard, as in many of our conversations, we carry around sandbags of people. And even when you cut the dead wood, there's still those dead wood memories. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And those take even longer, mm-hmm. I think, to just kind of get rid of. And then do we, do we need to get rid of them? I don't know. I think I, that there's an aspect of learning from them. I'm really big into forgiveness, and it's often mm-hmm. forgiving yourself from letting that person be there, forgive yourself for being that person that would be affected that way, and forgiving yourself from still... It, letting it be there mm-hmm. it's hard it's definitely hard but it's one of those things that it's if it's one percent better every month 12 percent is huge if you were a business and mm-hmm. you could improve 12 percent in one year you'd be made ceo so it's about little things you know it's right it's, so, it's okay if we're recording or not recording like we're not just talking it doesn't matter we are recording okay that's fine um I don't know about you guys, but I I want to be able to say, like I very truly want to be able to say that, that I'm all about forgiveness. Um, and in theory, I am. In practice, I don't know. Because I, I get so wound up with injustice. Like, I can't believe you treated me that way. Or I can't believe you did that to her. Or I can't believe. And, and then I go, no, it's, it's fine. It's not... Because the thing with not forgiving, it takes you back to the moment all the freaking time. Yeah, yeah. And you're constantly living it. I'm raising my hand here. I know. Because you know how I feel <laughs> Join about in. fucking forgiveness. I know, you're not um, good with I'm this. I'm not a fan of forgiveness. I am a fan of acceptance. Yes. That's I accept that that person did a shitty thing mm-hmm. because that's they control their own actions. Yes. And I don't need to forgive them. No, you don't. I don't want to because what you did was unforgivable in my standards. Like yes. somebody else might come with their lived experience yes. and be like, that wasn't so bad. You yeah, should not, you know, hug and make up or blah, blah, blah. But no, there are particularly, I believe, two exact people in my life that I will never forgive. Yep. But I accept what mm. happened. And I feel I like that. that's something to talk about as well, that we feel a lot of guilt about... Yes. I should forgive. I should be yes. the better person. Free yourself. But that's I where you forgive up. yourself. But it's forgiving oh, yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that that's not distinguishable in a lot of this like hallmarkism about mm-hmm. you know moving forward and growing and shit like this. Is the is the <laughs> idea again? I think it's shit. Um, <laughs> but you should forgiving yourself is part of that. I would rather say the word acceptance, and yes, that I, agree. I would rather I would rather say you know you do you than me say. I forgive you. Yes. Right? Like, that's not something that I can get really comfortable with. I don't sit in forgiveness well. But I you, I think you've just put it perfectly. It's that whole, the idea of it, this is what it is, or this is what it was. Yeah. And I can't change that, but I can alter how I let it impact me, yeah. I guess. Yes. One of the things that I learned um, when I was in the hospital day program last year, and by the way, um, if you're if you don't have a mental health 
or mental illness diagnosed, you don't get to go to the hospital to program, <laughs> but I got to go. <laughs> and it was great. And I met some amazing people of my fellow crazies, and we had this wonderful time of learning. And all of the things that we learned in that program were things like mindfulness. Yeah. But we also learned distress tolerance. And with that comes, so distress tolerance is your ability to withstand mm -hmm. the hard stuff. But one of the things that, that I've written about is radical acceptance. And one of the reasons, and the theory is, one of the reasons people stay spun in sort of this negative cycle, or they're mired down and I'll just call it emotional muck, is because we refuse to accept what is happening to us in this moment. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like what you said about, I'm, I'm in the past, or I'm in the future, I'm never in the now. What we do, So if I'm going to radically accept, what I would normally do is say, you know, my life sucks. I'm in so much pain. I can't believe I'm in this pain. I can't believe I don't have a job. I can't believe I don't have a spouse. I can't believe I don't. I, this is awful, awful. The pain is intense. I can't take it. You can't alter, fix, change anything unless you say, I accept that my life sucks in this moment. Yeah. It just blows. Because we try to push it aside, push it aside. We complain about it, but we push it. We, you have to, you've heard about it, like you have to sit with your pain. A hundred percent. You have to sit with your pain. And human beings, as I've said before, we like patterns, even if they're painful patterns. So that was such a, I felt great about it because it, what I don't do well with is Hallmark. I don't do well with platitudes. I don't do well with, you know, you're a beautiful person, just embrace it. I, I, I'm a little bit, like, give it to me between the eyes. And so that particular class really spoke to me because it was, the, the therapist was saying, stop it. The first thing you have to do is just stop it. Stop whining, stop complaining, stop doing all this. Stop it, sit with it, and then what are you going to do about it to get you through to the next moment? So there's that acceptance. And maybe forgiveness isn't for everybody, and who is to say? And that's why I think, like, hearing you being very magnanimous about, like, yeah. of course this person <laughs> is being a jerk to me because... That's I'm why I jerk. didn't look at you during that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, that... that, uh, that <laughs> You can under you can accept mm -hmm. and you can forgive yourself mm -hmm. for being that person, mm -hmm. and because that was that person, and I think it's really interesting um, that you were mar remarking that this is where this is where I really started to work and stuff like this, and I think that where things really started to turn for you is that even though you know uh, um, feeling like you don't have a lot of money, feeling like you don't have a lot of options, feeling like you're kind of in this rut, you quit your job that was fucking killing you. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the turning point for me to be like, holy crap, you were so worried about showing up, mm -hmm. having money, doing all these things. You love the dogs, right? Like forget the the admin and stuff like that. But you were like, no, this is this is awful. Yeah. And and that was a big turning point. Like, sure, when you eat broccoli for breakfast, that's like, <laughs> I'ma do a good thing, right? <laughs> but the fact that you were like, no, this is this is shit. And, and waiting in this shit is not something that I can do every day, even though you didn't have the answer already. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think yes, that's, that's something that a lot of people don't really pat themselves on the back for or give themselves credit for is that 100%. you didn't necessarily have a game plan of eating broccoli every day at that point. It was just, I can't do this. Yeah. And that, that, that in itself is very freeing and I know it can be very scary. All of us can stare down that I don't know what's after this, but I know that this isn't what mm -hmm. I can do every day. So I, th I thought that that was um, an underrated moment and I really appreciate yeah. that people can hear staring down that the I don't know yes. because I mean this is Because it's why, the right? abyss, right? Yeah. And we don't like the unknown. We don't like fear. We want to have a plan. We don't like pain. And I always liken it to, you know, you're in, sometimes you're in those relationships, a romantic relationship, and you don't want to leave it until you got a dude on the side. And mm. Okay, maybe that was just me, but I wanted somebody in the wings. Well, and that's what I didn't want. Because I didn't, I didn't when, when yeah. I was younger, um, you know, definitely when I was a teenager, and definitely, because as a teenager, with the stuff that I was dealing with, I thought I was so brutally ugly, and so brutally just 
like a giant spaz that if, if I, I kind of line somebody else up because mm. I don't know how long I'm going to be by myself. That's why both Lori and I went, when Heather moved in with Rob in your story. Yeah, yeah. we were like, that's not cool. No. Well, I think it was. I'm, I, but I, I know, love I, that you love you're fine, but you're fine I love that it. you're okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> both of us were like, that's great. Both of us just, were like, girl, you I are, see what you do. <laughs> I see it because I lived it. I see what you do there. And we, and we, there's something about that. But again, it, it takes We're such a lot. judgy creatures, aren't we? Oh, I'm, I'm and completely that's why I think I'm completely enamored uh, with your story is yes. that you really take a step back from having any judgment except for yourself. And that yes. is to be fucking admired. It is. Okay. It is. It is. <laughs> and maybe you're totally faking it. And he's like, I got them fooled. I but, mean, you can't see his face right now, but you definitely pulled a face of like, okay. <laughs> No, yeah. but it's true, and I, and I, 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 you, you use the word, and it's I can't top it. Is magnanimous? It's a great word. You know, well, really, it's what this kid is, man. Right? This kid is magnanimous. But we really appreciate you sharing, because I know people listening are going to go. Well, first of all, they're going to go. That's great. Wow. And then they're going to say, "This dude is magnanimous," <laughs> because because I'm learning something. But you're so you like you're talking about self love and self forgiveness, and. That's really all, he, all any of us have if mm-hmm. you break it right down. Control of self. That's it. You know, I'm in a very, I like to think, as healthy as I can be, marriage, but it's still just me because he doesn't make me anything. No. Right? We are there for one another, but it's not, yeah, and I think that that takes, I know. Anyway, okay. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you want to join the conversation, and we hope you do, come find us on Twitter and Facebook. And you can subscribe to us on iTunes and SoundCloud. That's it, Stigma Fighters. And remember, your story isn't over yet, and we want to hear it.